And my experiences have accumulated over the past more than 20 years. And really, I've been working to help both individuals and organizations really perform to their full potential. And I've been doing that through the design of physical workspaces, through the design of digital systems, and even through the design of business processes as well. And today, what I'd really like to do is talk about um, a story that I've had with one of the top 10 global pharmaceutical companies called Eli Lilly. And Eli Lilly came to Foolproof and asked us, hey, can you help us take eight websites across eight different geographic markets, across different languages, across different therapies, and create one responsive web portal? And we said, yes, of course, we'd love to. However, we started out designing a web portal, but through collaborating together with Eli Lilly, we actually managed to transform their organization. So to tell this story, what I'd like to do is start with the industry. And you might wonder, why, why are you just talking about the industry? This is about, this is about experience design. And I really think it's really important that us as designers, researchers, developers, we truly understand the industries within which our clients or our organizations are working. Because how can you actually design something that's going to help the organization and help the people within that organization if you don't understand the industry within which it sits? So let me tell you a little bit about the pharmaceutical industry. Historically, the pharmaceutical industry was making probably about 40%, in some cases, more than 40% profit margins. And those were the highest among all industries, what were hand in hand with banking. And a lot of people were criticizing pharmaceutical industries, saying, hey, you guys, you guys, you guys, this is crazy, right? This is, this is profiteering. What are you doing? These are crazy pro profit margins when there are people who need these medicines. And the pharmaceutical uh, companies argued and said, well, actually, we need those profits to invest in research and development. And it was true. If you looked at the top 10, they were investing 15 to 30% of their revenue in research and development. However, they were spending one and a half to two times more of that in sales and marketing. So what does that tell us? Well, what it told me was that pharmaceuticals saw sales and marketing as the best venue to get to, um, the best avenue to get to their, their end customers, the patients and the healthcare professionals. Okay, moving on to more recently, the pharmaceutical industry is being disrupted. Anyone who works in pharma, healthcare knows there's a lot of disruption going on. And in fact, what we're seeing in healthcare, we saw probably five to six years ago in financial services. And what's happened is all that money they've spent in research and development and creating patents, the patents are now coming due. When patents come due, that means generics are able to get their products out to market and they can sell it much more cheaply. On top of that, I think the global state of healthcare uh, is really struggling. So the global healthcare is now pushing pharmaceuticals to say, hey, please, come on, sell these medicines cheap, more cheaply. And the end users, the, the patients and healthcare professionals, are also saying, wait a minute, I've got these great experiences with digital, but my experiences with you, is, it's just it's lagging behind. This is horrific. So the disruption is these pricing pressures on pharmaceuticals are actually reducing their profit margins down to about 20%. So that means they have half the budget for R&D and sales and marketing. And what's happening is they're recognizing now that they need to do something significantly different to get a greater return on those diminishing budgets. And that was great. And that's when Eli Lilly came to us and said, can you help us? And that's the first thing I wanted to share. If you really want to transform an organization, you have to have chaos or disruption. The people running the organization have to recognize that the way they used to do business, they can't keep doing it today because they're not going to be sustainable. They're not going to be able to compete. So that was the first point. So we said, great, we get to work with Lilly. We're very excited. We're going to help them um, better reach their customers. And they brought us this brief. They said, hey, Foolproof, can you help us create an easier to find, an easier to consume, basically an easier to use website? We said, of course we can do that. We can take all those complex systems and make one responsive web portal. But surely you want to get more out of that reduced budget, right? You want to do more than just make something easy to use. So we went into our first meeting with them and we reframed the brief for them. And we said to them, hey, we think you should stop pushing pills. That's probably politically incorrect, let me reframe that. You should stop push marketing, stop selling, and start servicing your end users. And one of the guys in the, in the meeting room, that really resonated with him. He goes, yes, yes, I get that. Um, and he was saying, you know, it's really interesting because a lot of the people we're talking to are saying that as well. And so we share, we back that up with evidence. We had doctors saying, gosh, stop selling to me and understand my real needs. 
And why can't you make your digital products as easy to use and help me in my job like it does in my, in my personal life? So we reframed the brief and our, our, uh, our client recognized that and decided, yes, we need to move from um, selling to servicing. And we started talking to that group and we were also saying, well, okay, so what are we gonna start to do? Let's start unpacking, let's start looking at the data. And this is where we had the senior digital, a director of digital, who really it resonated with him. He said, you know, I know for a fact our data, both internally and externally, is telling us that people can't use our websites and they're constantly being sold to. What was interesting in that room is we had marketing teams saying, well, wait a minute, people don't expect pharmaceuticals to provide a service. They don't trust and they don't want it. I said, ah, that's your first misconception. That's not true. What we found out through the research we were doing was that actually healthcare professionals were using websites that had older information than the pharmaceutical websites. But the reason why they were going to those websites was because it was easier to find and consume. The information was packaged in a much better way. So we turned that misconception around and we embarked on turning Lily from selling to servicing. And that was the next point I wanted to make. First, you need disruption. The C-suites need to recognize they have to do something differently to compete. The second one is you need a champion at the top. You don't necessarily need someone in the C-suites, a CEO, but you do need someone who has the ears of the C-suites because you need someone to help champion and help um, progress the work that we're doing. And our senior director of digital, like us, recognized that there was a bit of a problem in Lilly. There's full of silo departments. You had the medical team working here. You had the marketing team working here. You had the IT team working here. You had legal and compliance over there. And what was happening was actually there was, no one was sharing information. There were no systems to share what we were learning about the end users. Um, there were power struggles. Goodness me, the power struggles were unbelievable. So with our senior director of digital, he helped us create a team. And we broke down those silos and we said, okay, we want a representative from marketing. We want a representative from medical. We want a representative from IT. We want legal, we want compliance. We brought in designers, developers, researchers, strategists, all together in one team. It was a big team. And this team was across the US, across the UK, across Europe, um, and it was quite a big team. And it was a really great way to just break down those silos and bring us all together. However, with many different voices and many different moving parts, gosh, we realized the success of this project hinged on having a North Star, a common vision of where we want to get to. So we brought all those people together in one room face to face and we invested up front in a two day workshop to say, okay, let's take all the data we have, let's take the insight we've brought and let's understand what should be the future. What is the experience vision for Lily? What is that North Star we can all ascribe to? And we did just that. And what we're able to do is if you look on the left hand side, we identified what are the outcomes that Lily needs to, to get? And on the right hand side, what are the outcomes healthcare practitioners need to get. And we start off with the basics, because obviously people need to be able to find the information, but what can we do to keep people on the site? What can we do people to explore? And we start with very functional needs, and we move up to the more emotional needs. So not only are we moving from selling to servicing, we're creating engagement, we're creating a connection with end users, so that by the end of this, people become the advocates. They start doing the marketing work for you. Ha, huh, that's how you take that reduced marketing budget and make it go further. So that, that's my next point, is you need to create from the very bottom, right? We were talking about people at the front line coming together, creating a vision together that we believed in and we could ascribe to and working together. So the next step is we know where we need to get to. Let's start having some fun and doing some design. And this is where we face some of the biggest barriers. Surprising, right? You think herding cats together to come up with a vision would be hard. No, this is where we face the biggest barriers. So I think many of you recognize, you might look at the design double diamond, iterative design process, human-centered design, Hital, it was lovely to hear her talk about ISO 9241 part 210. So really, this is the design process called different things in different places. What we learned was that actually at the beginning, envisioning when we're coming up with that vision and where we're gonna get to, that part of this process is really around certainty of the problem. What is it we're trying to solve? And in that part of the process, you rely on data and analytics, quant. At the end, implementation, that's when you want certainty of the solution, right? This is gonna work. Again, you want data and you want analytics and you want quant. Marketing team and the IT team were very comfortable at both ends. 
very used to using big data. But where we struggled was that middle bit, that discovery, the design and build. Because in that middle bit, that's where you don't need big numbers. That's where you want to explore the possibilities. You want to explore the solutions. You want to go deep into understanding, not what are people doing, but why are they doing it? What are their motivations? What, what are their pain points? What's happening in their world? Because that's where you find this, the best solution. Let me bring this story to life for you to help try and understand the difference between data and insight. So we went into um, our first session, first workshop together after the visioning and discovery. And the marketing manager said, Leslie, don't worry. We've got all the research. You don't need to do any more research. Let's go straight into start solving some, some, uh, some of these problems. Let's get into design. Come on. I'm like, OK, let's give this a go. I'll give this a go. All right. Let's come with some hypothesis. So we go into the big workshop. There's all those people from all over and marketing. And they brought in a management consultancy who said, GPs are time poor. Yes, that's a good piece of data, that's correct. Okay, as you know from the workshop Mario and Val did yesterday, you have to ask why, why? Why are they time poor? Okay, and in the workshop we all got together and we got some more data, because they have 10 minute consultations. Yes, they do, factual correct data. But what is that telling us? Um, and Lily also brought in some healthcare experts, behavioral change experts, and they brought a good piece of insight to that meeting and they said, we know that patients struggle to form a real, um, connection with GPs. And patients often say, GPs don't understand me. They're not really listening to me. And so someone got really excited. That's it. We are going to use digital to create a training program for consultants to have better uh, consultations. And I said, I'm, I'm not quite sure, guys. I think, we, I think we need to delve a bit deeper. And so we asked the question, well, what does this actually mean? What's happening in these consultations? What's happening before and after these consultations? When we asked that question in the workshop, no one could answer it. And the marketing manager went, we have been working for 120 years in pharma with patients and doctors, and we can't answer this question? Oh my goodness. So we did some what we call design anthropology. We went in and observed. We actually followed GPs around. We were in consultations. And that's when we went, aha. So what really happened? What was the true insight? Well, actually, GPs only have one minute in between each consultation. So that means if you have a 10-minute consultation, the first five minutes, that GP is spending all the time using different systems and devices with often poor Wi-Fi and 3G to figure out what medication was this guy on again? I can't quite remember. What's happened? What's the medical history? And then the next two minutes, talking to that individual, have you seen any other specialists? What did your nutritionist say to you? What else is going on? So then really, they only have three minutes left to actually do a proper consultation and engage with patients. So had we gone down the first solution of designing a digital training to teach GPs how to run better consultations, they still couldn't do it if they only had three minutes. So what we realized was, no guys, what we needed to do is design a solution, a digital solution that gives GPs back their 10 minutes. And that's what we did. And it was really great. And the whole team got excited and they understood the power and importance of qualitative research, what we call design research. But it still wasn't easy. <laughs> and I think, for me, this was probably the biggest thing I learned out of this, this project, um, was what I call the emotional roller coaster. In any design project you do, you've got to recognize this emotional roller coaster you go through as a team. So you have these moments of clarity. Ah, GPs only have 10 minutes, and they, don't, they can't connect with their patients. Moments of genius, we need a digital training system. And then we start unpacking, ooh. Hmm, moments of confusion, we're learning something new. Moments of, oh my goodness, I have no idea what I'm doing. To then moments of clarity again and moments of genius. And I think this emotional roller coaster, what I call the double diamond coaster, is really important to recognize and embrace. And so we stopped and we did just that and we reminded ourselves to trust, to trust in the approach that we're using and to trust in how we're gonna tackle this problem. Which leads me to my fourth point. If you want to transform an organization, if you want to really break down the traditions, the traditional beliefs, you have to bring that team together, work from the bottom up, have a vision, and take them on that journey. Bring them on that journey of learning and collaborating. And in fact, looking back on it, there were two things that sort of really resonated for me about the success of doing this and how we help transform the organization. 
And the first one was we had a marketer based in the US, um, and she was our hardest critic, goodness me. After every iteration we'd go through of, of research and design and evaluate and build, she was constantly saying, you're not testing with enough users. You're not talking to enough people. You, you know, this isn't going to work. And we would fight, and it was really difficult. But after a while, after about two or three or four iterations, she became our strongest champion. And she started championing customer experience all across Lilly. It was amazing. And in fact, the marketing department, they used it in their own words. That's another view of transformation of an organization. Instead of them regurgitating what we said, they said, hey guys, we need to stop push marketing and start creating the pull. Amazing, right? This was their language. And that's the way Lily now talks about customer experience. And of course, you still need the data, right? And we also found um, where they used to have about 1,000 visitors per year, they were now getting 1,000 visitors per month. So our senior director of digital was pleased. Uh, and it was a really, really great outcome. So to summarize, if you really want to transform an organization, moving them from um, marketing-led, data-led, and really, truly embracing customer experience, there are four things that need to happen. First, the organization needs to have some sort of form of disruption, chaos, to recognize, actually, we have to do something different because this ain't working. They also, you also need a champion that can help you within the organization to facilitate the right people to bring them together. You need one team coming together from the bottom up, creating a vision that everyone believes in. And finally, you need to bring them on that journey. And the success of this collaborative working together was amazing. Not only were we able to get a product, the right product first time out there in a cost-effective way, I think even more deeply, everyone actually genuinely, personally felt rewarded by working on this project together. And by everyone feeling that, personal reward, they were able to then tell the story to their colleagues and it grew and it continued to grow. So now not only are we working with Lily for diabetes and this web portal, we're also working within animal health and it's really starting to propagate, like dropping a petal in a pond, that CX, that new strategy of being servicing is now across the organization. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions, if anybody has one. I have a question. So I worked on a similar project for Apollo, and the same question was that they want to digitalize everything, and they want doctors to parallelly write what a customer is saying or a patient is saying with all the medicines they're suggesting, whereas they have limited time to do so. So a system, how, when you also say that they have 10 minutes only, and they have to listen also, give a suggestion also, and that fill that digital website that can be reused, what kind of solution you suggest and what exactly you did to bring that three minutes to ten? So yes, a good question. There's, there's two things we did. So first, when you look at the web portal, what was happening, it was Lily, like many other pharmaceuticals, you remember when you, you, know when you open up a medication, you get that massive piece of paper with a plethora of information. We broke that down into usable chunks and recognized GPs need different information at different times. So basically, that was more around the information design and information architecture to make it easy to find and consume. So that was the first thing we did. In the 10-minute consultation, that was specifically working with a diabetes team. And we worked on creating an app for patients. I can't go into too much information, but really the essence of that app was giving the patient more control, giving them control of their life. It was a big shift, right? This is something a patient's gonna own so that they can go into that GP consultation and say, Here's a snapshot, here's a dashboard of me in the past six months, and you can consume that in two minutes. Now I've got eight minutes to start thinking about, do I need to change the treatment, what do I need to do, and how do I create a treatment plan for this individual? Well, if it's a new patient, they may have the app, so we were looking at getting that app in places where um, it wasn't just through Lily, it was looking at getting them involved in diabetes-specific organizations. So it was beyond, beyond just Lily, it was getting the drug reps with the doctors, but thinking about diabetes-specific communities talking about this app. Hi, Leslie. Uh, one question I have is like, you know, what you are talking, I can understand is from a, a UK or US background where you have GPs are all connected and everything has that. But if I talk about from India context, so I just wanted to get your thought, like everyone is not connected uh, to a single system, but how we can try and make that connect, plus that remain the uh, GP generally go overshoot the time and the appointments just go haywire. So how we can control that if there is anything in the lily what you're referring? 
We didn't work out how you control that time, no. It was just about having all the information in one place, so you're not having to look for it. And again, giving that control back to the patient to be able to showcase, this is what's going on, this is what's important to me. Um, so the doctors has a better understanding of, oh, okay, this is what's going to motivate. Because it was really about adherence, getting patients to adhere to their treatment plans. So it's about making sure you create that connection and, f and follow through. Sorry, just a follow-up question on that. So, you know, generally nowadays people are getting tech savvy and sometimes they don't trust the doctor, right? They want to go and read about it and say, how is it helping it? It was making it more confusing because doctors always say, oh gosh, yeah, my patient thinks they know more than I do. Um, but it's, it's a, again, if you've got something that has all the information in one place and it's information they trust and they know, then they know they're not looking at Wikipedia or what have you to, right. to come to them with information. But again, we didn't go into a lot of detail in that research, but um, the doctors trusted the, the system. Okay, thank you.